Okay, welcome everybody to today's Exploring by the Seat of Your Pants session. My name's Sarah and I'm gonna be your host for today. And for those of you who might be joining us for the first time across YouTube or from your classrooms, Exploring by the Seat of Your Pants is all about bringing science, adventure, and conservation to classrooms across North America and the world. And today uh, we're gonna be diving deep into the sea. Uh, and we're going to be going aboard the Nautilus and learning a little bit more about what they have going on there. And the Nautilus is a 68 meter ship on a mission to explore the never before explored areas of the ocean and seek out new ad adventures and discoveries and share them with the world. Uh, we have better maps of the moon and Mars than we do of our own seafloor. And today we'll be joining the exploration vessel Nautilus live from the South Pacific as they map the seafloor around Jarvis Island. And these high resolution C4 maps will help identify unique and interesting features for future ROV exploration and to support the management and conservation efforts with one of the largest marine protected areas in the world. And so I'm going to bring the team aboard the Nautilus here and uh, we'll get to know them a little bit. Hi there. All right. Hi, every. Hi. Hey, Sarah. Hi. Thank you so much for that introduction. Um, you did a great way of, of, of encapsulating sort of our um, goals and objectives for the expedition season. And we're really excited to dive into yeah. this current expedition and what we're doing here. No worries. I'll let you take it away then. Okay, perfect. Um, all right. Well, hi, everyone. Thank you so much for joining us. It's always a pleasure to be a part of this program and to share the work that we're doing aboard EV Nautilus. My name is Madison Dapsovich, and I'm a communications lead here aboard the ship. Um, and my job is to host interactions like this and to facilitate discussions with communities and students and learners all around the world to better understand the work that we do aboard the ship. When I'm not at sea, I am actually a science reporter and journalist, and I'm based in Western Montana. Joining me today is Haley. Yeah, then thanks, Madison. I, um, I'm Haley Jordan, and I am a mapping watch stander on the EV Nautilus, which means I sit and watch the sonar and help collect the data as uh, we are going through this area and any area that we're uh, doing exploration in. And uh, we basically collect that data to prepare for the upcoming cruises and help complete that ocean map that you were referring to. Uh, when I'm not on Nautilus, I am still mapping the ocean floor, but remotely from uh, Columbia University's Laurent Doherty Earth Observatory. And I'm super happy to be here today. Yeah, we're so happy to have you. Thank too. you. Um, so we're gonna Haley and I are going to give you an introduction um, of the ship and of course uh, sort of a background of the exploration work that we do, the tools and technologies that help enable us to do that. Um, and then Haley will talk a bit more about mapping, the science of mapping, and this current expedition. Um, and after that, I would love to uh, open it up to questions for a Q and A at the end. It looks like. Um, you all can submit questions as they come up and we'll get to them during that Q&A session. So uh, as, as we're going along, all questions are great questions. They can be about the expedition, of course, um, life at sea, whatever, whatever you all would like to know, we're happy to do our best to answer it. But first and foremost, let's get you all acquainted with EV Nautilus. Um, so the vessel itself is a 224 foot exploration vessel, EV, of course, stands for exploration. Um, and that means we do a lot of characterizing and describing of the seafloor often in places that have never been done, uh, seen by human eyes before. So there are two main components of the work that we do aboard EV Nautilus. One is uh, mapping the seafloor and better characterizing uh, those features. And then the second is conducting remote operated vehicle dives or ROV dives. And that's actually bringing vehicles down to the seafloor to get visuals with the camera and then collect samples as we go along. So right now, Haley and I are coming to you from the control van here on top of the ship. Um, this is our mission control, if you will, where most of the science happens during an ROV dive. Uh, we're able to do that through the tele uh, technology known as telepresence. So we have a satellite system here on the back of the ship. Um, and then we also have our aft deck or back deck, which you can see in this drone footage is equipped with various pieces of equipment um, to help us launch and recover our vehicles, both ROV Hercules and ROV Argus, as well as supplementary vehicles that we uh, use as part of the Ocean, Educa uh, Ocean Exploration Cooperative Institute, or OECI. A couple of points of terminology for those of you who maybe haven't sailed. The front of the ship here is always called the bow, the back is the stern, 
This forward facing left side is always the port and then that opposite side is starboard. So port and starboard never change and that's a way that we can always orient ourselves around the ship uh, no matter what, what mm. direction it's facing. Um, but what do you think? Should we give them a tour of the ship in real time? Yeah, I think that'd be a great idea. Okay, cool. Where do you want to go first? <laughs> uh, let's do the aft deck. The aft deck. Okay, yeah. awesome. Let's go ahead and check it out. Okay, so you are looking at the aft deck. Um, we are just a couple of miles north of the equator. Yeah. So we've been having pretty smooth sails, really nice weather. Nice, yeah. I think we had one big downstorm of rain. Yeah, that's yeah. it. Um, so we've we've lucked out uh, here. So you're again looking at the aft deck, AFT, um, or back deck, and we have three main pieces of equipment that help us to uh, launch and recover our vehicles. This banana crane is used to. Um, uh, launch and recover are kind of our supplementary vehicles, the ones that join us on one-off expeditions. We have Drix, uh, we have Mesobot, we have Nui, and we can talk more in detail about those um, if you all are curious. We also have this A-frame back here. Um, so this is how we launch and recover ROVs Argus or Atalanta. Uh, and I'll show you some visuals of those as well. And then this white crane over here is how we launch and recover ROV Hercules. Um, so during a mapping cruise, of course, we don't have vehicles in the water. So it looks a bit more empty than it usually does. Mm -hmm. uh, but during the prime of our season, when we have all of the vehicles on the ship, uh, that back deck is a really busy place. Um, where do you think we should go next, the bow? Yeah, the bow seems like a great idea. All right. Yeah, let's let's show you all the sh the ocean in real time. Really pretty. Beautiful. So it mm -hmm. is just after 8.30 in the morning here. We both just had breakfast, um, watched a gorgeous sunrise, mm -hmm. and now, again, smooth seas as we're kind of heading off into that sunrise. Mm -hmm. <laughs> um, moving along, we also have... Our wet lab, it looks like there might be um, a bit of construction going on in there. Uh, but so our wet lab, it's so called because it's, it often gets quite wet when we're using it. Again, this is for our ROV dives. Um, which of course currently we're not doing, but when we are diving in the water, we often collect samples um, and those samples are processed and stored in the wet lab uh, for the duration of that cruise. Um, and then once we bring the ship back to port, they're shipped off often to Harvard uh, where they're stored and then researchers from around the world can actually collect um, and request those samples for their own uh, research initiatives back at their home labs. Mm. Moving on, we also have our control van. So again, it's empty right now because we um, aren't fully staffed. This is a mapping cruise. Uh, but here you can see that front row is uh, where our ROV pilots will sit. Um, and we also have a navigator that sits up there. And then that back row is where our science team sits. So we'll have a watch leader. Um, we'll often have a, a chief scientist in the sense that they are um, an expert in the ology that we're studying, right? So maybe it's a geologist, uh, maybe it's a chemist, maybe it's a biologist. This row is also where our communicators sit. Um, and then we also have data loggers in this area. So right behind us, you can see that that is the control van. Yeah. <laughs> kind of exciting. Um, or not so exciting right now because it's a little empty. <laughs> yeah. Will be exciting next season probably here. That's right. Yeah. 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 It's uh, If you all have seen the live stream right at nautiluslive.org or on our YouTube channel, that's where everyone sits. Um, so it can be a, a really fun energy when we're doing uh, exploration mm. in real time of the seafloor. Yeah. Okay, how are we able to do that and how are we able to come to you all in real time? Um, that is through this technology that I al alluded to earlier called telepresence. So here's a graphic that helps to um, visualize telepresence and also how we see our ROVs in the water. So that blue A-frame that we just showed you on the aft deck, you can see attaches both of the ROVs via a 7,000 meter fiber optic cable. This is ROV Hercules. Um, and any data like visual information um, through a camera is sent via that fiber optic cable to Argus and then up to the ship. That data is then sent to a satellite in space and then um, back down to Earth at the Inner Space Center at the University of Rhode Island. From there, the information that we're seeing in real time is sent to schools and communities all around the world. So just as we're able to come to you through the StreamYard event um, or for, from Zoom or Google Meets, we're also able to explore the seafloor in real time with viewers from all around the world. So that enables us this really unique um, kind of dynamic yeah. when we're exploring the seafloor where we open open up our website to questions, we can field those questions with a, a couple second delay, um, answer them. And oftentimes that actually like it, it informs our own exploration. Yeah, it gives absolutely. us a better understanding of, of you know, what what people know and what we need to know and, and kind of that different perspective. Mm. 
Um, so I will, I'll show you all a visual of ROV Hercules and Argus, and then Haley, I'll turn it over to you to yeah, talk about mapping. Okay, course. cool. Um, so let's see here. I'm going to pull up this visual of ROV Hercules. So as you can see, I'm just going to scoot this uh, video back a little bit. We have two manipulator arms on the front and an HD camera as well. That's our Zeus cam, and that enables us to get that high definition footage of the seafloor that you might all be familiar with. Um, ROV Hercules also has a slurp uh, to collect samples. We have various cutting tools as well. We have Niskin bottles, push core samplers. Um, we have bio boxes. And uh, we have this yellow foam that's called syntactic foam. So all of these elements together um, ensure that ROV Hercules is able to effectively operate in these very extreme environments, right? We are very deep. Um, it's very dark. There's an enormous amount of pressure. And sometimes we have extreme temperature fluctuations depending on where we're diving. Same with ROV Argus. Um, so this was that secondary ROV that you saw just a moment ago in that other graphic. ROV Argus really just has that one big camera um, in the front, and that is used to keep eyes on ROV Hercules. It's what we call situational awareness. So, of course, that's keeping an awareness of any situation that ROV Herc might get into. Um, so we want to make sure that it's not uh, in a dangerous position, like maybe it's up against a rock face or potentially um, too close to, say, an ancient coral species, uh, you name it. So that's really our ability to make sure that ROV Hercules is operating safely, both for um, its own self, right, um, as well for the environment that we're working in. So that's a look at our, our ROV program. Um, but of course, we are mapping. And Haley, we are kind of in the middle of nowhere, right? Yeah, we really kind of are. So uh, we are in Jarvis, which is about 1,300 miles south of Honolulu, and it is relatively unmapped, and the little island that th that is actually there has no biodiversity on it. There's no vegetation because everything is actually underneath the ocean there, um, and that's why we're down there to map it because uh, we were just talking about it. Even through all these uh, two weeks of mapping, we still it's still relatively empty as far as uh, data there. Um, but yeah, we're, we're, it took us five days to get there and it's going to take us five days to get back. Right. That's so, right. Yeah. 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 So this all together is a 30 day expedition. Um, so, you know, five days there, five days back, that's mm -hmm. 10 days altogether. That's about a third of our cruise plan dedicated just to transiting. Mm -hmm. Um, so that really goes to show sort of the logistical challenges of, of these types of endeavors and especially remote places. Yes. Um, so, and Jarvis Island, of course, we have our equator right around here, just above Jarvis, right? Just above. Yes. Just above Jarvis. Um, so we expect to cross the equator tomorrow, mm -hmm. which we're all very, very excited about. Yes. Um, but Jarvis and these other blue areas, these are all U.S. exclusive economic zones. Mm -hmm. So those are areas um, owned by the United States government. And collectively, they make up what's known as the Pacific Remote Islands Marine National Monument. So just as we have national parks, you know, and protected areas on land, we also have sanctuaries and monuments in the ocean. Mm -hmm. Um, parts of Jarvis Island are uh, on the table to uh, be considered as an addition to PRIM or the Pacific Remote mm -hmm. Islands Marine National Monument. Um, so this work that we do helps to inform policymakers about those decisions. And in addition to mapping, we'll come back next summer with the ROVs to explore the seafloor. And those, uh, the, those observations that we have will help to determine if it is um, an area that that's deemed worthy of being protected. Mm -hmm. um, okay, so when we're actually actually mapping. Haley, what does that look like? Yeah, so um, what you're seeing here is the ship above the water, but of course we're looking at what's underneath the water. We send a cone of sound down to the ocean floor and just like a bat or a dolphin sends sound to see where it's at, we send sound to visualize the ocean floor and we call that multi-beam. And that the multi-beam creates what you can see here called bathymetry and that shows us everything that we couldn't see from our little maps. So maps of uh, mountains and valleys, crevasses, uh, pretty much everything we have on land, we have under the ocean as well. And we make these so that we know where to send ROV Hercules and our other ROVs as well, uh, because without a map, uh, they don't know where to go. And we don't know where to search because we don't want to dive somewhere where there's not going to be a whole lot of biodiversity or where we think there's not going to be a whole lot of biodiversity. So these really help inform where we send our ROVs uh, on, on expeditions like this. 
And we're looking at different colors, Haley. What do those colors tell yes, us? Yes, uh, thank you for that. So that's like, uh, so the cooler colors, that'll be the blues and purples, indicate deeper areas. And the warmer colors, which are going to be yellows and reds, will uh, indicate like higher areas. So tops of mountains are red and bottoms of mountains are blue. It's really cool. I know that I, you know, growing up, I often thought of the seafloor as like a beach, right? Just yeah. really flat and sandy, um, maybe a couple rocks here and there. Mm -hmm. But as we're we're finding more and more and, and throughout our, you know, scientific explorations, we're seeing that these areas are actually very similar to yes. the terrain that we see on Earth, right? Yeah, as very Haley, diverse. Yeah, super diverse. And as mm -hmm. you were mentioning, we have mountain ranges, we have sea mounts or underwater mountains, mm -hmm. um, we have submarine volcanoes, we mm -hmm. have valleys and ravines. Um, so it's really, really cool yeah. to, to kind of explore. Yeah. Uh, you were saying yesterday we were sitting on the deck and um, Haley looks at me and she goes, can you believe that there's just a mountain right below this ship Yeah, right I was now? like, it's right there. <laughs> <laughs> so it's really wild. You know, we're seeing this very kind of seemingly flat ocean and just below that um it's a it's a completely different environment yeah yeah really cool um thank you for sharing that of and course. you know when we're i think it's really important to kind of get a, a good idea um of what that mapping actually looks like when we're um, before and after, right? And so we really call it satellite altimetry data um, to begin with, right, Haley? Mm -hmm. And um, that information that we have moving on is then uh, that multi-beam information. So this is actually um let me zoom in here real quick before I pop on over into this. So this is an image um, that Haley created using some of the systems aboard the ship. Um, and for those of you that are familiar with Google Earth, this might look familiar as well. Mm -hmm. um, so this is a graphic that we took from our situation report, which is um, a report that we keep internally to just update each other on, on what's going on. Um, and Haley, so this is the Jarvis area, right, that yes. we've been operating in. Mm -hmm. Um, so there's the equator. You can see Jarvis Island right here. Mm -hmm. um, and then you can also see these sort of like lumps and bumps along the seafloor. They don't have a lot of definition, right? Um, they're a little fuzzy looking, but we have an idea that that's probably a seamount or an underwater mountain. Um, we also have like these ridge lines, right, that, that we think are probably a, a seamount ridge. Yes, um, yes. But we don't have that detail. No. And so you can see this pink track line. This is actually where Nautilus had mapped. This uh, sit rep is from two days ago. So you can see these track lines where our ship actually went around the ridges and mapped them in real time. Haley, you had a funny word for it. You were calling it the... the... Oh, yeah, the Mario Kart track. That's what the mates on the bridge were calling it. They were <laughs> saying, because we keep making loops around everything and every seamount, we keep doing little circles around them. So they <laughs> called it the Mario Kart track. So, yeah. And then when we look fun. at that actual image, you can also see... See, it looks kind of like the Rainbow Ridge from Mario Kart. It really Kart. does, yeah. Um, so this is a really great example of what that definition changes uh, to mm -hmm. when we actually come in with that multi-beam sonar system aboard the ship. Um, so again, you can kind of see that satellite altimetry data, that Google Earth information right here, very fuzzy. Um, but even one track line begins to show us that there's so much more definition. And this could be kilometer differences between altimetry and actual bathymetry. Right. Yeah. So yeah. it's it's a huge difference. Um, and so then again, Haley, you were saying these these warmer um, colors are, are deeper areas and these or these cooler colors. Yes. Rather, are yes deeper sorry. <laughs> and these warmer colors on top are, are shallower. So yes. we're looking at, you know, what is that? Probably like 3000. Easily. Yeah. 3000. Like so that's 3000 to 4000 sometimes of a difference, depending on where we are on the ridge. Um, so yeah, it's it's huge, huge ridge that of course we have relatively no information about. So we're really happy to be here to be the first people to lay, lay eyes on it and also to be able to give this information to uh, this next year's season for the ROVs to look at it as well. That's right. Yeah. yeah. And even when we do bring ROVs down, it's kind of like um, I use the the example of uh, bringing a flashlight into a gymnasium, mm. right? If you turn off all of the lights, there might be bleachers on one side or a basketball hoop on the other, um, but you only have one tiny flashlight and that's mm -hmm. our light on the ROV. And so we're tracking up one wall. And so even when we're exploring these areas with these really high definition maps, yeah. um, we still don't know what's necessarily all the way around us. Yeah. So we're only with the ROVs still just kind of seeing that one line of, of visualization. Yeah. Um, but collectively, these maps contribute to much bigger goals, right, Haley? And yeah. Those, you're part of those as well? Yeah. So uh, I'm a part of the Nippon Foundation Jebco SIBA 2030 project, which is a long name, but it basically means that we want to have a publicly available ocean map of the seafloor by 2030 
100% mapped uh, because currently we are only at 25% mapped as of the last release. Um, and while 25% is actually a significant amount of growth because uh, it was only at 6% just like five years ago. Oh. Yeah. Wow. So it's really important. So in addition yeah. to, uh, those are kind of like our, the three main things I look at, right? We're mm. trying to map 100% of the seafloor by, mm. by 2030. Yes. Um, so that's one initiative that these maps contribute to. Mm -hmm. We are uh, understanding this area for mm -hmm. future um, decision making policies about yeah. it. And then of course, we're informing our ROV dives. Yes. And so when we're diving in an area, um, what does that look like? Right? So this is an example. Uh, this was taken off of the coast of Central California near Monterey Bay. Um, I believe it was in 2019. Hmm. And this was an octopus garden that we came across completely oh. unknowingly. We didn't know this was here. We just knew that this, based on maps, looked like an interesting uh, part of the seafloor to explore. Um, and what we found, actually, I'll pause it right here, was uh, all of these brooding octopus or nursing mm -hmm. octopus. Um, so they're inside out because these are actually female octopus that are uh, protecting and, and brooding and hatching their mm -hmm. eggs. Very so you cool. can actually see some of these eggs in here. Um, again, we didn't know that this was here. It was a really exciting discovery. I believe the ROVs were actually getting ready to uh, be recovered. So oh. our pilots were getting ready to bring the ROVs back to the ship um, when we came across this. And what is especially fascinating about this area is we don't know a why all of these octopus chose this region um so you can see that they're kind of in this line right a few theories are maybe there's some seepage coming from the seafloor yeah maybe yeah. it's a warmer water maybe um there are minerals or nutrients mm -hmm. coming from that something like that yeah. yeah so here's kind of that visualization we're just like one little flashlight in a huge room right yeah. um so this is a visual taken from rov argus you could see sort of that downward facing perspective um so again, these are we were looking also at some different coral species here, really long branching corals. Mm. Um, but again, it's really you know just beginning to understand our world. Um, we like Haley mentioned, and as Haley or Sarah mentioned earlier, we have better maps of Mars than we do our own planet, mm -hmm. um, our own ocean floor, and so this is really our kind of beginning steps in better characterizing um, and getting to know our Earth. So that's one example, one of my favorite examples. because That's I, gorgeous. I, yeah, I just think it's such a neat thing. And um, I also like, why? Why are you there? I wish yeah, I could ask the yeah, octopus. <laughs> yeah, and it's really interesting because it seems like the places that we find geologically interesting, the animals do too. Yeah, yeah. right. That's a good point. <laughs> yeah. Um, we're all connected somewhere. <laughs> um, so that was a lot of us talking. I would love to open it up to questions, Sarah, if, you, if there are any from the viewers. Um, if not, we can totally just keep chatting about work that we do aboard EV Nautilus. Yeah, that was a great description and so cool to see all those octopus hanging out and, <laughs> yeah, you know, existing in what you call an octopus garden. I didn't realize that's mm. the term for that, um, which is really mm. cool to see. So we can go jump to some questions. We have some classrooms joining in from YouTube. So don't forget that um, everyone joining in on YouTube, you can post uh, the comments in there and we can jump to those too. We also have two classrooms joining in um, live here behind the scenes. So we can go to them and ask a few questions. Um, so we'll jump to Cameron Crossing School and uh, we'll have them ask their question here. No. Oh. Hi, thank you so much for that tour. It was amazing. Absolutely, thanks for joining everyone. Hi, good to see you. Uh, we have a question from one of our students is, do you happen to know what type of octopus they were? I do, yeah. Okay, I don't wanna um, completely yeah, it's mess hard up name. the name. Because <laughs> uh, I don't know what the common name is, but uh, I, I believe it's actually pearl octopus. Um, and the scientific name is Musco Octopus Robustus. Mm. Um, might be Musco Octopus. Uh, so sorry if I- Brush if up I on our it. Latin. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, but I believe it's pearl octopus is, is sort of the common name, which fits, right? They look yeah, a little- Yeah, a little pearlescent yeah, kind of. Yeah. yeah, really pretty. Mm. Thanks everyone, great question. Okay, we're going to jump to Mr. Shaddock's grades five and six. Um, there's someone ready to go and asking their question there. Um, it, do, do you guys have, um, uh, do, 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 do like big whales and stuff interrupt whenever you guys are um, with, with the sound scanning? I don't, I forgot what it's called. The mapping of the floor. Yeah, the multi-beam sonar. 
Yeah, yeah Haley, you can probably answer that. I could answer a little bit about that. So sometimes the uh, we get uh, animals that are sensitive to sound, like uh, dolphins or whales that are interested in our equipment. They'll kind of hang out around the ship because they're really curious. Um, but also they're just curious because we're in the water with them. Um, but uh, usually we don't see so much uh, megafauna, uh, like so big animals, big mammals in particular. Um, but occasionally we do get to see them uh, with our ROV or off the bow of the ship. Uh, usually they don't interrupt our um, actual sonar, our uh, multi-beam. Uh, we have had, uh, I believe, a shark bite on something that we put, an instrument that we put down in the water so much that, yeah, yeah, that's what John told me. Our, right. our coordinator said that they put an instrument in the water and it was biting on that, but it wasn't a sonar, so, um. yeah. Does the sonar ever affect the, the animals in this ocean? Uh, we aren't, that isn't super conclusive, but we do have um, different steps that we take so that we don't um, actually uh, harm anything. We're just, because we don't know 100%, so we uh, change if we ever spot any mammals or animals that might be sensitive uh, to sound. So that also includes turtles. We will put it in mammal protection mode, our sonar. So we do have uh, steps in place just in case um, that does happen, because no matter what, we want to be the best stewards that we can of our ocean. Awesome. Great question. And yeah, as Haley mentioned, we don't see a, a whole lot of big animals, right? right. Um, but we do sometimes. And I would love to show you all one of my favorite videos. Video. Um, so this was Again, this is that perspective from Argus looking down at ROV Hercules, and you can actually see a big whale that came to visit it's ROV really Hercules. Cool. Yeah, so um, for reference, our Herc is about the size of a U.S. Postal Service truck, um, so it's quite large. So you can see just by comparison how big that whale is. Um, and this is a really cool shot. You can kind of see its eye poking out. It's got a big mouth and its fin almost waving hi to us. Um, so we, we believe based on the size of this whale, that it was probably a juvenile, um, also based on the behavior, right? So more mature, older whales probably would steer clear of our ROVs. They're very bright. Mm. They're quite loud. They're, they're pretty large. Um, but this this little one was really curious <laughs> about what we were doing. Uh, and of course, this there, you can't see the seafloor in this visual. And that's because we were doing what's known as our blue water um, sort of portion of a, of a dive. And that's when we're bringing the ROVs down to the seafloor or recovering them back up to the ship. Um, and so those those descents or ascents can take uh, around three hours, depending on the depth that we're diving at. Um, so oftentimes we just see a whole lot of blue water. There's not much going on. So this was an especially fun treat uh, to have that whale come and, and say hi. and <laughs> Taking a peek at us. Yeah, it's so cute. <laughs> I, I love, love that. <laughs> I'm also, I grew up in Alaska, so I, whales are near and dear to my heart. Uh, yeah, so anytime I see, I see that, one yeah. there, it's a special treat. What a friend. <laughs> so great to see a bit of all the wildlife that lives a bit deeper than we could even, you know, see from boats and everything, get a whole different perspective from it. So thanks for showing that video. That was really awesome. <laughs> cool. One question that came up while you were talking is you talked about a wet lab that you had there. Um, mm. which I find very interesting, just kind of studying science and university. And so I was wondering what kind of things that you're able to sample in that wet lab and, and what kind of research are you going to be doing there most of the time? Yeah, that's a great question. I'll pull up a quick photo here. Um, so this is a uh, just a look of some of our scientists that are working in the wet lab. Um, so we we can really collect a variety of different samples. That depends on um, the objectives of that cruise as well as our permits. So our permits really dictate uh, what we're allowed to sample and, and not sample. Um, so we'll we'll process geological samples. So if it's um, a geology cruise, we'll take rock samples of the seafloor. Um, using our manipulator arm to go ahead and grab a hold of those. We will do scoops. So we kind of mm -hmm. have like a, a scoopy shovel thing that'll yeah. scoop up um, some, uh, <clears throat> excuse me, pebble-sized rocks. Mm -hmm. And then we'll also do sediment core samples. Um, in addition to that, we can do, uh, we can take biological samples. Mm. Um, so let's see if I can pull, I'll look for one while I'm chatting here. Um, so we have those two manipulator arms, of course, that can uh, go ahead and grab a hold of different um 
biological samples. So maybe we'll we'll take a coral, a snippet of a coral. Um, sometimes we'll slurp gelatinous critters mm. uh, like like tinafores, yeah, and jelly for, yeah. jellyfish. Um, those will be stored in we have tubes as well. Uh, and then we'll also take chemical samples. And so doing that, we deploy um, bottles, Niskin bottles that mm. uh, collect water from the water column, and we bring those back up to the wet lab for eDNA processing. Uh, so it really depends. Um, and for each of those crews, we'll have a number of scientists who are, mm. uh, you know, really interested in that work. So, for example, I was on a cruise in August, um, and there was a, a squat lobster and a sea pen expert um, who were on the ship with us. And so <laughs> we were at Johnston Atoll primarily looking at sea pen um, and squat lobsters. Uh, so, so that was a lot of the goals were collecting those and, and also getting visuals. And I'd say a really important component of sampling is collecting visual information because um, we can't always collect an organism, right? Uh, this is one example. This was a sea pen. Um, its scientific name is Solembalula. And this was seen uh, near the waters surrounding Hawaii. And we know that this sea pen um, is at the very least an expansion of its previous range. So this identification expands where we thought these species were located. Um, there were known to be in nor more northern colder waters. So this is the furthest south that we've seen it. Um, you can see that there's not another sea pen in that area. So we're not going to collect it, right? That's, that's one of our really sort of priorities is that we don't want to diminish the biodiversity of an area. Um, so this being one of the only species here, we left it alone, but we do get very in-depth visuals of it. And that's so that the scientist, um, for example, a sea pen expert, can determine perhaps this is a new species, uh, which we have a hunch it might be an entirely new species. Um, so it's really exciting when we see these things. But again, we're the we're the E in exploration <laughs> vessel, right? So we're yeah. doing that exploring. We're seeing the seafloor. Um, we're collecting those observations. And then a lot of it are the scientists who join us on the ship um, and then back at home to uh, begin to do that analysis in their lab, to write the papers, to go through the peer review process, and then of course to publish their research. Um, so this is a great example. In addition to the wet lab, we also have these um, abilities to collect these really in-depth visuals that will help to inform our scientists. And I mean, plus it's just like a really cool animal. Yeah, I was just going to say, that's a, just a beautiful animal. It is. It's so neat. Yeah, it's yeah. so unique. Yeah. And it's big. So those two lasers that you saw there, um, 10 centimeters is, mm. is the distance. And that's what we use to um, size things in the water. So it's actually quite large. Yeah, too. very tall and mm -hmm. just like a big actual, yeah. like actual animal mouth. Yeah. It's really cool. Yeah. Good question. Really great. Really great to see them, um, how like high depth you can kind of get those videos as well. Right. right? Um, kind of seems to be enough there. Super cool. cool. Thanks for showing us that. Uh, we'll jump to Mr. Shaddock's class again. I see somebody there so we can ask another question. What is your um, biggest, op biggest octopus you found? Can you say that one more time? What's your biggest octopus you found? Biggest Ooh, the biggest octopus. Hmm, that's a great question. I'm not sure what the biggest one is, but I will show you one of my favorite cephalopods, which is in the same sort of family as octopus. Oh, this one's really cool. Yeah. yeah um, I really enjoy this one. Plus it has a cool name. Yeah. <laughs> uh, so this is a vampire squid. Um, fun fact, vampire squid are neither squid nor octopus. They kind of sit in the middle of the evolutionary tree there. Um, but it's called a vampire squid because it has that really dramatic shimmery cloak, right? It almost mm -hmm. looks like a vampire's cape. Mm -hmm. um, but one of my favorite things about these, these organisms are those Dumbo-like ears that it has on its head. And those are actually its fins. We see this a lot in the deep sea. Um, and then vampire squid have a unique adaptation. You can see it kind of curling inside out. It shows those spines as a way to threaten would-be predators. So maybe in that moment, it thought that, you know, we are we are scary. Yeah. <laughs> um, so it was trying to scare us off. And then, of course, it realized that we're not so bad. Mm -hmm. um, and then it gave a bit of a show for us. So it may not be the biggest octopus that we've ever seen, um, but I think it's definitely one of the prettier yeah, ones. Yeah, it does have some drama to it, which I love. Very much, yeah. There yeah. you can see the eye. Oh, yeah, gorgeous. Um, 
Really, really cool. And so those Dumbo ears that you saw, right, it's actually fins, as I mentioned. Um, but that's actually something that's an adaptation that we see often in the deep sea with a lot of these cephalopod species. Um, so let's see, I'll pull up another one. Uh, for example, we have this one here. Um, same thing. It has those cool kind of dumbo -y ears. This one's a little more translucent, mm. um, but equally as beautiful. And it looks like it's almost dancing in a snowstorm. And it kind of is, if you think about it. So all that white stuff uh, is what we call marine snow. Um, marine snow, also known as detritus. Uh, it's basically the dust. So just like we have dust on land that's made up of like skin cells and dirt and maybe hair, um, anything that sloughs off of another item, uh, we have that in the deep sea. So this might be fish slime um, <laughs> or scales. Uh, and so it, it kind of creates this really dramatic environment. And a lot of the deep sea organisms like that Salembalula or sea pen that you saw earlier will actually grab a hold of detritus or marine snow mm. and eat it. Um, so this this marine snow, right, it could be a whale from the surface that dropped down some skin sails. It actually brings a lot of nutrients down to the sea floor, mm. um, which is really important because there's not often a lot of nutrients um, that we see. Another way that the deep sea is able to feed itself, if you will, are through what we call whale falls. So this was also um, off the coast of Central California. So lucky. Yeah, Monterey Bay National Marine Sanctuary. This was at a depth of about 3,200 meters. Um, same thing. I think we were at the end of one of our dives and we came across this whale fall. Um, so it is a car the carcass of a whale. We believe based on that front, um, you can see its jaws. So it's a baleen whale. And the size, we think it's also probably a juvenile. Um, but as you can see, this area, it's there's not a lot here except for this whale fall. And so that carcass actually brings with it a bunch of different nutrients uh, for deep sea organisms. Mm. So here you can see octopus that are eating. Um, you can see rat tail fish. Uh, in just a moment, we'll zoom in and you'll see um, an eel poking through one of the ribs. And then this brown sort of material. Yeah, there's the eel right there. Um, this brown material are actually bone worms. So they're eating. Um, different nutrients from the bones mm. so it you know in these areas where there's not a lot to consume there's not a lot of nutrients like there are maybe um at the top or you know at shallower um whale falls like this bring that to the sea floor and you can see all of these organisms are really taking advantage of it yeah, i like how nothing's left behind nothing's wasted that's yeah. for sure mm -hmm. um and here's a cool visual again from argus and you can see the the comparison of that whale uh, with ROV Hercules. And again, that look of just that tiny little flashlight, right? <laughs> so had that whale fall been, you know, 10 yards to the west, maybe we wouldn't have seen yeah, it. Yeah, we would have just like skirted right by it, not yeah. seeing it. Yeah. So that just goes to show like we're, we're seeing a lot of the seafloor, but there's just still so much left to see. Yeah. So awesome to see. Seeing those whale falls made me think of um, something else that happens in the deep sea, hydrothermal vents. Have you guys come across those? Oh. Yeah, so we have in the past, mm -hmm. not on this current one, but Haley, you actually um, helped to discover a new Yeah, field. yeah. On a different vessel, um, I was able to, just a couple of months ago in the Galapagos, we found a brand new vent field, um, Sendero del Congrejo, and uh, we were really excited because we like searched for hours and hours and hours, and like you said, we only have that one swath of light to look at, so we might like have skirted right by it at certain points, but like... Uh, we finally found it actually by following squat, squat lobsters. That's oh, cool. why it's called Sendero del Congrejo. It's path of the crab um, <laughs> because actually uh, squat lobsters are more hermit crab than they are lobsters. Oh, interesting. Yeah. Okay. So, yeah, yeah. And um, we were very lucky. But I think we have some images from one that we were on uh not too terribly long ago, right? Yeah, so this is um, not in the Galapagos, uh, but this is off the coast of Western Canada, mm. and it's um, Endeavor, uh, Hy Endeavor Hydrothermal Vent Field. Um, so it is, as, as Sarah was mentioning, this is a way that the deep ocean does get nutrients and minerals. Um, so if you've ever been to like Yellowstone or a hot spring, um, it's very much the same sort of processes below the seafloor. So it's a hydro hydrothermal activity mm. or volcanic activity of sorts. This is called um, a black chimney smoker because it looks like black smoke coming out of a chimney. Um, and this is a, the view of our front porch of ROV Hercules. Um, so here you can see the manipulator arm grabbing a temperature probe and we're testing the temperature of that, that um, 
chimney. Uh, as I mentioned earlier, sometimes we're operating in really, really hot environments. So this is over 600 degrees Fahrenheit. Um, so in addition to heat in these areas, there are also a bunch of different uh, material noxious gases that seep out from those vents, um, which are seemingly inhospitable, right? We would think it might be hard for organisms to live here, but we're finding that these are actually hosts of really diverse colonies for of sure. animals. Yeah. Um, so for example, we're looking at tube worms. We can see an isopod in the right corner mm -hmm. there, um, maybe a little shrimp in the back. Uh, <laughs> we're looking at mineral buildup and also bacterial mats. So um, colonies of bacteria that are chemosynthetic. So just like plants use sunlight for energy, we have organisms in the deep sea that use chemicals for energy. Um, and hydrothermal vents are really interesting. We only discovered them in the 19th 70s and in the decades since have found thousands more. Um, and they're telling us a lot about our ocean environment. So, uh, and especially how maybe early life has formed. Um, and in addition to that, maybe how life on other planets yeah, forms or yeah. is forming. Um, so we like to refer to these as living laboratories in some senses will bring, um, we've paired up with NASA in the past to bring some of their equipment and technologies down to hydrothermal vent fields um, and to test their remote operating abilities so that we could see if they would be effective in space. Mm -hmm. um, again, because we think that these environments really hot, very cold, very dark, a lot of atmospheric pressure um, might mimic what other planets are like. So yeah. it's, it's like our own little lab on Earth. Yeah, yeah. It's really cool. Those worms that are down there, they can be like nine feet tall and like the circumference of our arm. It's just, it's insane oh how gosh. big they can get. It is like another planet. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> That's what I was about to say is it's really crazy to think about how the ocean that we see, you know, depending on where you live, it helps us understand what other planets like in our solar system can be like just because it's that mm -hmm. out of touch otherworldly in some ways. So really cool to Absolutely. see that. Um, we're going to jump to Mr. Shattuck's class again. We have another person here waiting to ask their question. Um, have you guys found any new species or discovered anything new? How many have we discovered anything new? That's a really great question. Um, we are discovering things all of the time. Yeah, yeah. We're seeing things all the time. As Haley mentioned, she helped to discover that new hydrothermal vent field. Yeah. Um, that sea pen I showed earlier is probably a new species. One thing uh, that I really like to highlight is a lot of the science happens back at shore, mm. right? So we're doing that exploration. We're seeing things along the seafloor, um, but that work, so our samples and our videos are sent back to scientists and experts in a given field who can then determine whether or not something is indeed a new species um, or brand new to science, yeah. um, an expansion of range, which means that animal uh, has just, uh, we've seen it in a, a different place than we previously saw it. Mm -hmm. um, so we're, we're, visualizing those all of the time right and what's really cool is not just like if it's a new species but like uh like how old they can get how big they can get because mm -hmm. we have like several species that can get a thousand years old under because then they're in the deep sea they're not disturbed and i think we have like a coral that we might be able to show you with that yeah absolutely so that's such a great point Haley. we have um right because we're we're seeing a lot of these places for the first time um and so one of those items that we see are, are coral which yeah. are this one we believe to be a thousand years old yeah um so maybe so big. it's and it's huge <laughs> yeah and so maybe it's not a new species um but it is a very old species and that's telling us a lot about this environment like this this organism was able to thrive here for a really long time mm -hmm. without being disturbed um so it's it's a really great look at just kind yeah. of the the diversity of these areas not just new species but new information about mm -hmm. the areas yeah absolutely really cool yeah. gorgeous and um i know that we're we're almost out of time so uh i'll show just one one more quick video here if i can pull it up this is a really cool example um, in addition oh, to those yeah. thousand year old corals that we sometimes come across we also have entire entire coral fields. Mm. Um, so this is in Papahanaumokuakea Marine National Monument. And there are just, I mean, hundreds of, of 
individual coral species. Um, so these are probably not a thousand years old, like that big one that we just saw, but several of these are very well decades old, if not centuries yeah, old. Slow growing for sure. Very, very slow growing. Um, and you can just see that the different colors and just how concentrated this is. Um, so based on the concentration, how many individual species are here, it's probably an area where a current comes through that brings with it a lot of different minerals um, or, or nutrients rather, mm -hmm. It like in marine snow. So um, these animals are actually able to thrive in this area because it's it's very nutrient dense. Hmm. Great question as well. So amazing to see. And thank you so much for sharing some of your knowledge and your experiences on board. It's so cool to be able to see just the work that you're doing out there. It's, it's absolutely amazing to see how it it translates even over to space exploration and, and all of those things. <laughs> It's, it's a whole different world, truly. Um, if the classrooms wanted to learn a little bit more about Nautilus, is there anywhere that they could go to learn more or, or get more information? Yeah, absolutely. Um, so all of our highlights, like a lot of the videos that you just saw are available on our YouTube page and on our website. Um, Typically during ROV dives, everything's live stream, so we'll open up the question box. We don't do that during mapping cruises, but at that link in the bottom um, of the screen, we are, you can access a special event on Monday uh, at 10 a.m. Hawaii time, where we'll have the entire mapping team in the control van behind us here, and we'll be feed, feed, fielding <laughs> the questions in real time. Um, so if you have any questions that you didn't get to, you can send them to our team. Um, I'll be there to ask that, ask those questions. Um, you can you can say hi to Haley and myself yeah. <laughs> if you want to give us a shout out, and it'd be really great to to reconnect there if if you have questions that we didn't get to. Amazing, and thank I know you so much for having us. Yeah. Definitely. Okay. <laughs> no, thanks for joining because I know there's a bunch of kids with a lot more questions, but it's good to know they have a place to ask more and to learn a little bit more if they're interested. So um, thanks for sharing that. And uh, we hope to be able to talk to you soon. So thanks for taking the time to join us today. All right. Okay. Thank you, everyone. Thank you. Thank you for your questions. It was so great to connect. We'll see you next time. <laughs> Bye, everyone. Thank you for joining.